It was a morning just like this one, but a really long time ago. People had gathered together under a covered outdoor courtyard. And the sun was just rising in the east, and the, the courtyard faced the east. And so sunlight and warmth were flooding the area. The, the ladies began to fan themselves because it was starting to get warm. The little kids were amusing themselves with little improvised toys and eating fruit snacks. And the men leaned in to hear the preacher who was going to bring God's word today. Now, this preacher was very popular, although sometimes he was a little controversial. He stirred it up a little bit. And wherever he was, he always drew a crowd. Well, the sermon had just begun, and he was just bringing God's word, and people were leaning in. It was a great message. And all of a sudden, some people came in and interrupted they, they came right to the front uh, between, between the teacher and the crowd. And that preacher was Jesus, and the interrupters were the Pharisees. They were the ultimate religious rules keepers of that day. And through a sting operation, they had caught a woman in the act of adultery. And they dragged her there to, to Jesus. It would be like in this setting right there between Jesus and the crowd. The Bible specifically says there was a crowd gathered around. And they were trying to trap Jesus into saying or doing something that would either be unpopular with the people or that would go against the, the, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, and those other commands. So they bring this, this woman up uh, in front of Jesus, and they say, the law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? We're going to come back to that story in just a moment, after the break. No, no, there is no break. Today, we are going to discover something that you might be doing that you're unaware of. You may not even realize you're doing it. It's something that actually puts you in danger. It's something that harms your relationships. And it's something that puts off people towards Christianity. It, it repels them from it. It's something that if you could turn this one thing around in your life, it would change everything, literally everything in your life. It's the sin that the Pharisees were guilty of that day. And a lot of times in this story, we lose sight of that. So would you turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. We, we, we're in a mini-series called Next Level Relationships. Uh, out of It's a small portion of the great Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached. And so you, if you're following along, you might say, hey, I skipped ahead. Yes, I did. I skipped ahead in the Sermon on the Mount to pick up the other, the other sections that are about relationships. And later, we'll come back and pick up the ones we skipped over, and we'll, we'll group those together as well. So Matthew chapter 7, continuing on in the Sermon on the Mount, starting at verse 1. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Do not judge others. And you will not be judged. So there is a warning and a promise, uh, a potential um, punishment and a potential reward in there, depending on which way you go. <laughs> Verse 2, he said, For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard, the uh, sort of like the manual, the uh, benchmark, that you use in judging others is the standard, the benchmark by which you will be judged. So then Jesus goes on and he, he kind of brings some, some clarity and he begins to ask us some questions as his followers. And why worry about a speck of sawdust? And that's what it is. It's a splinter, a speck of sawdust in your friend's eye. When you have a log, you have a fir tree in your own eye, how can you think of saying to your friend, here, let me help you 
Get rid of that speck in your eye. It's an obnoxious speck, and we must remove that speck straight away. How can you say that, Jesus said, when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. Ouch, Jesus. Ouch. Ooh, he's getting up in our business there. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Now, when Jesus says, do not judge others, that, that word judge actually has kind of a wide range of meaning. Uh, this, this same root word is used in different ways. Uh, but we, we can see here by this context that he is saying, don't pass judgment on people. Don't condemn them. And in this passage, some of the other passages that we'll look at today, that word judge and condemn are used interchangeably, but it's the same root word underneath. So that's how we know Jesus is talking about don't pass judgment on people, don't condemn them. So it is fine for followers of Jesus Christ to read the Bible to conclude that a certain behavior is wrong. So the Bible says certain things are wrong. So it, it, it is right for us to say, okay, I'm seeing this thing, I, I can tell that behavior is wrong. It is also correct to say, hey, I'm seeing this behavior, this action that I'm taking or someone's taking, and I can see that it's right. I, I conclude, based on my reading of God's word, that this is a good thing or that other thing's a bad thing. That, that's fine to do that. Even though I know even that may be upsetting to some people. But you are not to pronounce on someone or on a group of people, you are condemned by God. That's what Jesus is talking about. We, we know certain behaviors are right or wrong based on the Bible, but it's not our job to say to somebody, that behavior you did, you're sunk. You're out of God's will. You're out of his plan. You're going to hell. That is not our job. And that's what Jesus is saying. Don't judge. Don't do that. Don't pass judgment on people. Don't condemn them. There, there was a, a group uh, in our nation that was a little bit more in the news in previous years, I think, than they are now. And the, the name of their, their church is the Westboro Baptist. Now, they had, they gained so much attention because of signs that they carried, things with messages like this, God hates you. I have a picture of one of their signs, God hates you. And I conclude, based on my reading of God's word, that behavior is wrong. The making of that sign, the showing of that sign, their message and their message, I conclude, based on the Bible, that is wrong. First of all, it is a lie because God does not hate you. God himself said, God so loved the world, the world, everybody in it, that he sent his only son that everyone believes in him could have eternal life. That's the truth of God's word. So, so I can conclude that sign is wrong, but I'm going to stop there. It's not, I'm not the judge of them. I, I, I don't know their hearts, and I'm not pronouncing judgment on them. But I can tell you that behavior, that's wrong. That, that is biblically wrong. <laughs> Jesus teaches us, don't judge or condemn others, or God will start using your standard to judge you. Yikes. And I can tell you this, our standards for other people are always a lot tougher than our standards for ourselves. So if you start judging and condemning other people and God uses that standard on you, yikes, that is a scary deal. Instead, Jesus says, notice the sin in your own life and deal with that. Let's be, that's what to be concerned with. Recognizing your own shortfalls leads to humility and repentance and growing in holiness and, and being more like Jesus. So then, if you, if you approach following God in that way, you're just working on the log in your own eye. You're just dealing with your own sin and working that out. Then, instead of condemning others, you will humbly help others 
as fellow strugglers. It is a very, very different approach. And it is the kingdom of God way. And that is what Jesus is calling us to. And in the kingdom of God, in dealing with people this way, everyone benefits. The kingdom of God grows in us internally, in, inside me, inside you. And the kingdom expands to more people. Everyone wants to come and be a part of a group that is loving, forgiving, helpful, supportive. Like that, that is the kingdom of God. And as we become known for those things, humility, love, forgiveness, instead of judging and condemning, the kingdom of God expands. And earth becomes more and more like heaven. And that sounds awesome. That is fantastic. That is what we want to happen. Um, unfortunately, Christians and the church are more known, according to surveys today, for judging and condemning than we are for loving, forgiving, helpfulness, and support. That's not the kingdom that Jesus instituted that is, that's, then we're missing something. And I, I'm going to just throw myself right in there. So we're missing something if that's how we are and that's what we're known for. Jesus has something else in mind. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he's giving us a vision of the now and not yet. At the same time, simultaneously, the kingdom of God is here. It's now, it's, it's expanding, it's growing now. And it's not fully glorified yet like we're going to be when we see Jesus face to face. But Jesus is already there. God is outside of time. And he's already, he, he came from heaven to earth. He ascended back to heaven. He, he has this vision in, in his mind that he's bringing us to. It's sort of like a house designer. We always have HGTV on in our house. It's, it's, it's considered white noise. I, it's just always on in the background. And the thing is, uh, uh, can I say it? We heard it this morning. <laughs> the homeowner says, I can't picture it. I can't even picture it. Wait, the design you're talking about, I can't picture it. But the designer can picture it. She has already seen it. She's already drawn it. She already knows when I draw things like this, this is how it turns out because I've done it in other households. And that's the way it is with Jesus. He's already seen it. We can't always picture it. What? A world where everyone's loving, supporting, and forgiving? Like, we can't even picture it. Jesus says, but I can. I just came from there a few days ago. I've seen it. And that's what I want to bring here to earth. And that's what followers of Jesus, that's the mission we signed up for. To come and follow Jesus and be part of the kingdom of God and to extend the kingdom of God. And it is a kingdom where God alone is the judge. Imagine a kingdom where no court system is needed because no one sins, no one wrongs their neighbor. There is no need for court in the kingdom of God. Only God is, is the judge. No other judge is needed. Wow, that's the kingdom. Now, it's begun, but we're not quite there yet, right? It's now and not yet. In James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, it's another uh, portion of the Bible. It says, don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job, listen to this, if you want to know what your job is, your job, my job, is to obey the law, not to judge whether that applies to me or not. God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? That is spoken to me, spoken to you, spoken to you. That, that, those are the words that, that are spoken to us. God is the judge. We don't condemn others. It, that is, it, God knows the heart, and it's up to God. Now, those of us who read the Bible frequently, and I've been reading the Bible uh, since, well, how many years now? I've, I've been alive 35 years, so uh, at least, <laughs> uh, well, maybe a little more than that. I guess, I guess uh, you can go to, uh, to hell for lying, too, so I, I, I'll let's bring that back. So I have been reading the Bible, I would say, about 55 years, either having it read to me or, or reading it. And I'm very familiar with the Bible. I, I, I can tell you 
uh, where a lot of well-known verses are. I just know. It's, yeah, I, I just know where it is. I'm very familiar with it. The problem is, for those of us who read the Bible, it's a blessing and a problem. The blessing is, we begin to get God's perspective. I know how God thinks about stuff, and that's how I know certain things are wrong or certain things are right, because I've, I've read enough of his, of his word, I know how God thinks. The problem is when we begin to think we're God. I know how God thinks, so I'm God. I can tell you if you're going to hell or not. I can tell you if you're all right or not with God. I can tell you because I know how God thinks. That's the danger for those who are very familiar with the word of God, and it's the most danger for pastors and teachers. For some reason, that is just something that that can happen. So the more you read the Bible, the more you know how God thinks, but you got to remember the Bible is God's perspective on humanity, which includes you and me. So when I read the Bible, i got to remember, I am reading God's perspective on Garrett, not my perspective on others. Do you see the difference? And it's so easy to slip in there if you've been reading the Bible a lot. God is the judge, and you and I aren't. We're not. So back to the story of the Pharisees condemning the woman. I'll pick it up where we left off. John chapter 8, verses 5 to 8. The law of Moses says to stone this woman that was caught in the act of adultery. What do you say, Jesus? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. We got a crowd that had gathered to hear the sermon. We got this, these Pharisees standing around demanding an answer. We got this woman, this poor woman, drugged there in front of everybody. And Jesus says nothing. He bends down and starts writing in the dust with his finger. By the way, same term used for when God wrote the Ten Commandments with his finger. And it's kind of interesting. And uh, John, a lot of times, uh, makes those connections very uh, more than any of the other gospel writers. He, he, he just sees it. So they kept demanding an answer. Jesus, what are you going to do? We, we've asked you a question. The law of Moses says stoner. What do you say? Give us an answer. He stood up again, and this is what he says. All right. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone, the stoner to death. Then he stoops down again. I started writing in the dirt. God, see, move. Oh, my goodness. Catch this. Jesus was the only one there that day who had never sinned. So he is the only one who, who has a right, uh, based on what he just said, let, let him without sin or who never sinned, throw the first stone. He's the one that could have. And he didn't. He's the only one that could have. And he chose not to throw a stone at her and condemn her to death. None of us has the right to cast stones because all of us were born in sin. And yet, that's what we do all the time. I bet in the past week, you and I have cast a few, a few verbal stones, possibly with the word. Possibly. Let's go on in the story. John chapter 8, verse 9. When the accusers heard this, uh, when they heard him say, let him with, that's, with, uh, that's never sinned, cast the first stone. When they heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd, the congregation, in the middle of the crowd, with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again, and he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? There's that word again, the same word, judge, condemn. Didn't even one of them condemn you? They had condemned her to die. They said, we condemn her to die. That's what the law says. We're ready. We got the rocks. Just give us the go ahead. They had condemned her. They all left, though, because they suddenly realized that they were just sinners themselves. If they'd picked up a rock to stone that woman, they would also deserve to be stoned. So he asked the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? Verse 11, no, Lord, she said. 
And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. I don't condemn you. Now, it's common in Christian circles to say that the moral of this story is, I'm about to step on some toes, including my own. We would say, and I've heard it said so many times, the moral of this story is, love the sinner, hate the sin. Give me a blink if you've ever heard that phrase. Love the sinner, hate the sin. But if you look closely, there is no hate in this story from Jesus. He wasn't hating anything, even the sin. He wasn't hating anybody. The point of the story is not love the sinner, hate the sin. That is not the point of the story. The point of the story is that there is grace and mercy in the kingdom of God. That's the point of this story. And it's, I hope you can see the connection. These people who were judging her, Jesus says, okay, let's go ahead and just apply that same standard of judgment you got to you. And let's see how you stand up. Are you going and sinning no more? I could ask the Pharisee. I could ask you and me. How many times have we, have, have we said, well, go and sin no more. You need to stop what you've been doing. How is your sinless life going? How is my sinless life going? It's not going very good. Can I just be honest and blunt? I have not re yet reached perfection, but that's the, that's the standard that we have all held on everybody else who was tempted by something that we're not tempted by. For all these centuries and decades, there is forgiveness and help for you from Jesus in the kingdom of God. Jesus is for you, not against you. That is the message of this Bible story. I know, uh, people have been trying to figure out for 2,000 years, what was he writing? What was he writing in the dirt? What was he writing in the dirt? And a couple suggestions. He might have been writing, do not judge. Do not judge. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He might have been writing that right then. Or he might have been saying, grace works wonders. Grace works wonders. Grace works wonders. And that's what he did. He offered grace. Author Justin Lee wrote, love the sinner, hate the sin, feels very different depending on which side of the table you're sitting on. To the person doing the loving, it feels very generous. Wow, I'm a good person because I'm loving you in spite of your bad sin. However, to a person on the receiving end of love the sinner, hate the sin, it can sound frustratingly judgmental. Judgmental. Jesus said to love your neighbor as yourself. He did not say to love the sinner as yourself. But our phrase is, hate the sin, love the sinner. Jesus never said, go and love the sinner. He said, go and love your neighbor as yourself. It's the most important thing you could do. What a different perspective. Joe Forrest wrote, love the sinner, hate the sin, sabotages grace because it trains you to see people to, uh, who think and live differently than you as sinners rather than neighbors. Remember the story that Jesus told to illustrate what a neighbor is was with two ethnic groups that were opposing each other, and one of them, got, a guy got beaten up, and the other one helped him. So a neighbor is not just someone who just goes to your church, although it could be. It's anyone you come interact and you interact with, you're connected with in any way. That's a neighbor. So this phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin, trains us to see people who think and live differently than you, see them as sinners rather than neighbors. Instead of seeking out sinners to love, we gradually become predisposed to be on the lookout for sin to hate. Oh my goodness. So instead of love the sinner, hate the sin, I, I want to propose, uh, that's the common thing to say, but I want to propose a, a little better thing. Maybe it would be better to say, 
love the sinner, forgive the sin. That's what Jesus does with sins. Jesus doesn't walk around hating sins. He forgives sins. And maybe even better yet would be love the neighbor, forgive the sin. Love the neighbor, forgive the sin. Wouldn't it be cool if our congregation could start a new trend in the Christian world where we replace that old saying that we just shot holes in and instead we have this new, with this new saying, love the neighbor, forgive the sin. Love the neighbor, forgive the sin. Well, you know what I always say, love the neighbor, forgive the sin. Wouldn't that be cool if we started that and the kingdom of God would come to earth? Wow, that would be awesome. Would you stand to your feet if you're in the room? If you're online, would you, would you just make the place where you are a place of, of prayer? Put down that sandwich, and let's just focus just for a minute on the Lord. All right, we're going to pray. Would you bow your heads with me, everybody? And let's pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for your grace and mercy to me, first of all, since I'm praying. Thank you. Lord, I want to thank you for your grace and mercy to all of us. I remember your word that says, while I was yet a sinner, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, the righteous for the unrighteous, the holy for the unholy. Before I was a good Christian boy, Jesus, you died for me because I was a sinner. And I am still born in sin. I'm only saved by grace. We're saved by your grace, by your mercy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I, I pray that you would forgive us when we have been judged for all the times that I have been and we have been judgmental towards others. When we have condemned someone, when we've gone beyond saying this behavior is right or wrong to saying you are right or wrong, you're going to hell. You must be far from God. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us for those thoughts, for those intimations. Lord God, forgive us and renew our tongue, renew our hearts, renew our minds. With your head still bowed, I, I would like to just do a little focused prayer here. Would you be honest with me? How many of you need help to be able to see the log in your own eye? And I'm, I can tell you this, if you've got a log there, you don't know it's there. <laughs> so I'm thinking this might, might be a good unanimous prayer. How, you need, how many of you need help to just see those things in your life that are sinful, that you don't even recognize are there. Jesus called them logs. Would you raise your hand? Yeah, my hand is up. I know I can't see what I can't see. I know I can't. Holy Spirit, reveal it to me. All right. And then how many of you would need help to show love and mercy to your neighbors? That means anyone connected to you in any way. That annoying in-law, raise your hand. That, that coworker that just grates you so much, and on and on it goes. You need, you need God's love and mercy. All right, you can put your hands down. And how many of you need help to leave the judgments to God? Let me see your hand. You, you just, Lord, help me, forgive me. Help me to quit being the judge or the condemner. Help me, Lord. Let's pray. Lord, you've seen our honesty today. We've raised our hands to you on these, these statements that are not very easy to raise our hands to, Lord God, we're asking you for help. And that's the wonderful thing. Even right now, Jesus, you're not condemning us. Thank you, Jesus. You stand ready to forgive. And so, Lord, we confess those things that we're aware of. And, Lord, we ask you to make us aware of those things that we need to deal with. Lord, help us to not be so concerned about getting everybody else's life cleaned up. Help us to clean up our own life. Show us how. Help us how. Help us to do that, Lord. Start by revealing those logs, those things that we can't see in our lives, Lord God. Show us, reveal us, and help us to help us to do something about it, Lord. I pray that you would help us uh, in our congregation and everyone who's listening. That's a part of our congregation online, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be the most loving, forgiving, merciful, grace-filled, gracious-speaking people on the planet, Lord. May we start a new trend. I know our workplace is caustic. May we begin to change that by our choices. I know our neighborhood has some issues. Lord, may we begin to change those. Lord God, I know our school 
has some division. Lord, I pray that you would help us to begin to be peacemakers and uh, mercy extenders, Lord God. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to not judge others. Lord, help us to be gracious with others the way we want you to be gracious to us. Oh, Lord God, help us instead to pray. Help us to offer humble help. Help us, Lord God, to just be helpful, loving, supportive, forgiving Christ followers. Praise you, Lord God. That's what we want to be. We want to be just like you, Jesus. Help us, Lord. Yes, help us, Lord. Yes. With your head still bowed, I, I want to give you an invitation. I don't want a Sunday to go by. I, I don't want a broadcast to go by without inviting you to put your faith in Jesus. I hope you can see. I mean, we've been talking about sort of like cleaning up, you know, our, our, our part of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is awesome. We are all born into sin. We all need a Savior. And if you've never put your faith in Jesus, you need a Savior too, just like I do. I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus and begin to follow him. How do you do that? Turn from your sin. Turn your life over to Jesus. Say, I now belong to you, Lord, and let him lead. How do you let him lead you? You begin, you begin reading the Bible and you begin saying, oh, wow, I'm not supposed to judge you. That's Jesus leading you to a, a different and a better, more fulfilling life. If you want to do that today, if you would like to become a Christian, put your faith in Jesus, whether you're online or in the room. Would you just raise your hand right now like we've been doing? It's a, it's a signal to me for prayer. Yeah, yeah, I see, and that's so great. I, I love that. God just loves honesty. So would you just, would you just pray to God? I'm going to coach you in a prayer. And as he brings something to your mind that is a, a, a sin, a particular sin, if he brings it to your mind, would you say, Lord, I'm sorry for that. Please forgive me of that. I, I own it. I confess it. Please forgive me. But I just want to lead you all, coach you in just a, a simple prayer to get you started. Would you repeat after me online or in the room? It doesn't matter. Would you repeat after me? Jesus, pray it to him, not to me. Say it again. Jesus, I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you. Starting now, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we just want to welcome you to the family of God, to the kingdom of God. And I, I, I want to just know, I want to celebrate with you, I want to encourage you. If you just made that decision just now, whether you're in the room or online, would you text the word restart, because you're restarting your life following Jesus, restart to the phone number 97,000. And that, that will let me know. We'll shoot you a quick text back. God bless you. Such a great word from God. Thank you, Pastor Garen. That, I don't know. I mean, it's such a straightforward message. But, I mean, I felt like there was just so much there that we can learn. You know, we're not God. We're not supposed to judge others. Great message. And, I mean, how many times have I said in my own life, oh, you know, love the sinner, hate the sin. And, and I realized I've been wrong. You know, and, and I agree with Pastor Garen. I think we can start something different. So that's awesome. But uh, so uh, new with us, first time, anybody? Uh, go ahead and text <laughs> GREET to 97000. We want to, you know, get to know you, meet you, bring you back. Um, yeah, super excited. And if, uh, you know, we have the baptism next week, that's super exciting too. If you want to be a part of that, if you're interested, even if you haven't signed up, there's that baptism class right out there. Please join us. Of course, we have got our connect groups too. And if you're watching online, go ahead, hit the subscribe button, smash the like button, you know, share it with your friends, share it with your family. We just want to bring as many people in as we can. And, you know, we look forward to seeing you guys next Sunday, online or in person.